My dear brothers and sisters, President Hinckley's family has asked that I, Brother Monson, conduct the funeral services for our beloved prophet, President Gordon Bittner Hinckley, who passed away on Sunday, January 27, 2008, at the age of 97. The death of this wonderful leader brings to a close a chapter in Church history spanning over 50 years of faithful leadership. President Hinckley's lifetime of service to the Church reached across borders into the hearts and the homes of people throughout the world. The Quorum of the Twelve and other general authorities of the Church and the wives and widows of general authorities join in extending their love and condolences to President Hinckley's family. We acknowledge President Hinckley's bishop, David M. Parrott of the 18th Ward, and his stake president, Lynn J. Ames of the Salt Lake Ensign Stake, both of whom are seated on the stand. We thank all who furnished the many lovely flowers and who have otherwise given comfort and assistance. We also acknowledge the help given by the General Relief Society Presidency and others in arranging the flowers and providing compassionate service. In welcoming all who are present and those who are watching, these services on television or by satellite transmission, the family has asked me to express special appreciation for the many honored guests who have joined with us in these sacred services. We are honored to have with us today Michael O. Levitt, United States Secretary of Health and Human Services, representing the President of the United States. We note that President and Mrs. Bush sent the following message of condolence, and I quote, Laura and I are deeply saddened by the loss of President Gordon B. Hinckley. We know this is a difficult time, and we send our heartfelt condolences. President Hinckley was a remarkable man and a good friend. While serving for over second dec seven decades in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, President Hinckley demonstrated the heart of a servant and the wisdom of a leader. We hope the many memories you have of him will bring you strength and comfort. May you be sustained by your faith and the love and support of your family and friends, and may God bless you." Close quote. Other international, national, and local government, education, religious, and civic leaders have sent their regrets, as have many members and friends too numerous to mention. In behalf of the family, we acknowledge with appreciation these many expressions of sympathy, goodwill, and understanding. The family also acknowledges and extends their sincere thanks to medical personnel who attended President Hinckley. Prior to these services, the family prayer was offered by Sister Jane H. Dudley, President Hinckley's daughter. The music today will be by the Tabernacle Choir under the direction of Craig Jensen, Jessup and Mac Wilberg with Richard Elliott and Clay Chris Jansen at the organ. The choir will open these services by singing, My Redeemer Lives, the words of which were written by President Hinckley. The invocation will then be offered by Brother Clark B. Hinckley, President Hinckley's son, singing by the choir.
most kind and gracious Father in heaven, we are so grateful this morning for the blessing of gathering together in these funeral services for President Gordon B. Hinckley, whom we loved as a father and grandfather and great-grandfather, and as prophet, seer, and revelator, and president of the church. We are so grateful for the restoration of the gospel in these last days, for the marvelous appearance of to the prophet Joseph Smith, wherein thou didst visit him along with thy only begotten son and ushered in this great and last dispensation. We are grateful for the priesthood authority and priesthood keys which were restored and for the fact that these have remained in the church in an unbroken chain from the days of the prophet Joseph Smith. We are grateful for those men who hold those keys this day and pray that thy blessings will be upon them. We're grateful for this beautiful facility in which we meet, built under thy inspiration. We are grateful for as we meet together and pray that thou wilt pour out thy spirit upon us here as we gather in this building and in locations all across the globe where other saints have gathered to participate in these services. Wilt thou strengthen and support us, comfort us, and pour out thy spirit upon each of us and be with us throughout these proceedings and throughout this day. Bless us that we might always be faithful and obedient, that we will follow the example of this great man whom we recognize today in these services and for whom we had such a deep and abiding love. These blessings we pray for in the name of thy beloved Son, our Savior and Redeemer of the world, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Sister Virginia H. Pierce, President Hinckley's daughter and representing the Hinckley family, will be our first speaker. She will be followed by the choir singing, Crossing the Bar. I am honored to speak on behalf of our family at this solemn and sacred occasion. We desire to raise our voice in celebration of the life of our father and prophet and to bear testimony of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ on this beautiful winter morning. How grateful we are for the love shown toward our Father and to us as his family. We thank you, each one of you, for your prayers and many kindnesses. We thank the doctors and nurses who have guided his care and have acted with respect, diligence, compassion, and great skill. We must thank Dad's secretary, Don Staley, an extraordinary man of humility, capacity, and generosity, who, along with a marvelous staff and wonderful security officers, have literally made it possible for our Father to, to fulfill his responsibilities as the President of the Church. We cannot find words to tell you of our love for our Father's associates and their wives. President Monson, President Irene, and President Faust, whom we miss, have been counselors extraordinaire. President Packer and the Quorum of Twelve, the Quorums of the Seventy, the Presiding Bishop Brick, the General Auxiliary Officers. As quorums, presidencies, and individuals, we have found them to be devoid of selfish interests and completely dedicated to the Kingdom. In that context, they have helped, loved, and assisted our Father, and by extension, us. There is nothing so touching to the human soul as to see men and women of great power extend private, thoughtful, and quiet kindness. Sometime during the year of 1837, in the back country of Ontario, Canada, John E. Page came, preaching the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Wearing the coat Joseph Smith put on his back in Kirtland, Brother Page and his companion taught the gospel to the Hinckley and Judd families, as well as many others. 
Lois Judd Hinckley, Gordon B. Hinckley's great-grandmother, was among those baptized. With her children and other family members, she followed the Saints south. By 1843, they found themselves in Springfield, Illinois. Her son, Ira Nathaniel Hinckley, now about 14 years of age, made his way to Nauvoo. He became a skilled blacksmith and builder. He married, and in 1850, on their way to the Salt Lake Valley, cholera claimed Ira's young wife and his half-brother. He buried them himself on the same day, then picked up his 11-month-old baby and finished the journey. Ira would spend the rest of his life answering the needs of a colonizing church. Cove Fort stands today as the product of his able workmanship and devotion. Ira Nathaniel's son, Brian S. Hinckley, father of President Hinckley, was an educator teaching at Brigham Young Academy and the LDS Business College. He was president of the largest stake in the church for many years. He knew heartache and faced challenges that would test the faith of the strongest saint, but he never wavered in devotion to the Lord and His Church. Speaking at a devotional at BYU in 1999, President Hinckley recalled, quote, These three generations of my forebears who have been faithful in the Church, reflecting on their lives, he said, I look down at my daughter, at her daughter, who is my grandchild, and at her children, my great-grandchildren. I suddenly realized that I stood right in the middle of these seven generations, three before me and three after me, and there passed through my mind a sense of the tremendous obligation that was mine to pass on all that I had received as an inheritance from my forebears to the generations who have now come after me." Close quote. As part of those generations who have come after him, we thank him and our mother for the tempered strength of their link between our forebears and us. Our parents loved us, they taught us, corrected us, laughed and prayed for and with us, and we honor them. And we likewise pledge to pass on to future generations our complete devotion to the Savior and His Church. But this isn't just about our little family, five children, 25 grandchildren, and 62 great-grandchildren. Because as President Hinckley has often told us, we are all one great family, some 13 million strong, sharing an inheritance of faith and enjoying a covenant relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ with responsibilities to help one another along the way. Our father was adorable, and he was a marvel to watch. Disciplined and courageous, with an unbelievable capacity for work, he believed in growth. A favorite scripture reads, That which is of God is light, and he that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light, and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. That process of continual growth is the story of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that he loved to tell, as well as the story of his own life. That kind of growth requires faith, courage, discipline, and hard work, partnered with the gracious hand of the Lord. At no time was this growth process seen more forcefully by us as a family than during the past, past four years, the capstone years of his life. Following the death of mother, his grief was almost overwhelming. Characteristically, he acknowledged it. He felt it. He wept and mourned deeply. He went to the Lord with his tears, thus allowing the loss to carve out an even deeper place in his heart for compassion and dig an even deeper well of faith and trust in God. Then with that increase in compassion and faith, he put on his shoes and went back to work, in every sense of the word. Two years later, as he faced a diagnosis of cancer, he repeated the pattern. He did what all of us would do. He mourned the loss of good health and felt the fear of a disease that had taken his mother 
his brother, and two of his sisters. Knowing that his life was in the hands of the Lord and feeling the power of prayers of millions of you, he said that he felt compelled to do his part. And with the wonderful help of medical friends, he did just that, with courage and good humor. The result was a miraculous two-year extension of his life when he could get up each morning, put on his shoes, and go to work. Exactly one week prior to his death, he offered the dedicatory prayer of a renovated chapel in Salt Lake City. In that prayer, in a very unusual way, he petitioned the Lord for himself as prophet. He spoke with gratitude that, quote, from the days of Joseph Smith to the present, thou hast chosen and appointed a prophet to his people. And then he continued, We thank thee and plead with thee that thou wilt comfort him and sustain him and bless him according to his needs and thy great purposes. We bear testimony that his peaceful passing is evidence that the Lord heard and answered his prayers according to his needs and the great purposes of him who reigns in the heavens, who died that we might live forever, and in whose name we close, even the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen.
One word says it all. Beautiful. We shall now hear from Bishop H. David Burton, presiding bishop of the church. He will be followed by Elder Earl C. Tingey of the Presidency of the Seventy, following which the choir will sing, What is this thing called death? With words written by President Hinckley. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Sister Pierce, as you so tenderly spoke of your father, I was reminded of his words in the October 2004 General Conference. He said, as your, a father, do I love my daughters less than I love my sons? No. If I am guilty of any imbalance, it is in favor of my girls. I have said that when a man gets old, he would better have daughters about him. They are so kind and good and thoughtful. I think I can say that my sons are able and wise. My daughters are clever and kind, and my cup runneth over because of this. Virginia, you and your siblings, along with the grandchildren, collectively stand at the apex of the many earthly accomplishments of your loving and justifiably proud father and mother. May the Lord's tender mercies be showered upon each of you at this time of loss. Upon being informed of his passing, my unprepared emotions found me standing in a darkened room with tears of sadness rolling down my face, soon to be replaced with sweet tears of joy. I suspect many of you stepped foot on that same emotional roller coaster. The young people of the Church have a great affinity for President Hinckley. He has been their prophet for most of their lives. He was their hero. To use their vernacular, he was awesome. He connected. Because of him, they know what it means to stand a little taller. Do your best. Raise the bar. And what the six B's are. Be grateful. Be smart. Be clean. Be true. Be humble, be prayerful. Within a few minutes of President Hinckley's passings, the airwaves containing the text messages of hundreds of thousands of youth were circling the planet, conveying their feelings of sorrow and loss. Suggestions for Sunday dress at school, along with expressions of respect and love, continue. Thank you, dear young people. You have led the way in honoring and eulogizing our dear prophet. Bishop Edgley, Bishop McMullen, and I have been tutored weekly by our beloved prophet and his loyal counselors. We were present when President Hinckley was advised that President Howard W. Hunter had passed away. We noted his countenance as the announcement was made. We sensed and witnessed the mantle of senior apostles squarely settle upon his shoulders. We have been privileged to operationalize a number of his inspired endeavors. Thank you, President Hinckley, for your love, your confidence, your direction, your in inspiration. The media has well chronicled the accomplishments of President Hinckley. Each of the Latter-day Prophets has left a unique legacy. When I think of President McKay, I think of family and his great love for a sweet MRA. With President Smith's doctrine and gospel knowledge come quickly to mind. For me, President Leake, compassion and correlation President Kimball connotes repentance and conferral of the priesthood to all worthy males. President Benson makes me think of his warning to beware of pride and his counsel to study the Book of Mormon. For President Hunter, temple of worthiness was paramount. With President Hinckley, there are so many significant accomplishments. Perhaps time will help sort them out for each of us. One of the last meetings President Hinckley conducted was of the Board of Directors for the Perpetual Education Fund. As the status of this fund was reviewed, President Hinckley exclaimed, This is remarkable. Then, after a brief pause, said, It is a miracle. President Hinckley was about miracles. He knew that breaking the cycle of poverty in developing countries was critically important to full participation in the gospel of Jesus Christ 
and its attendant blessings. Generations yet to come will be blessed by this legacy. I once attended a meeting in President Hinckley's office, which was enlivened by some post-business reminiscing between Elder David B. Haight and President Hinckley. These 90-plus-year-olds engaged in a session of, Do You Remember When? <laughs> After some remembrances were shared, Elder Haight inquired, President Hinckley, how many temples have you either dedicated or participated in their dedication or rededication? President Hinckley began to identify each of the then 47 operating temples. My memory is that he had a part in the dedications of over 30 of the 47. He then said, My, I would love to be alive when the 100th temple is dedicated. Later, he repeated this statement to the brethren in the temple. Soon his desire was to have 100 operating temples before the beginning of the next century, January 2001. By 1998, 51 temples were operating. In 1999, 15 more were dedicated. And in the year 2034, with Boston Temple being number 100, later this month, Temple 125 will be dedicated in Rexburg, Idaho. A miracle? I think so. Prophets are about miracles. On July 24, 1997, President Hinckley broke ground for this conference center. In describing this building in the October 1998 General Conference, he said the following, It will be primarily a house of worship, but it will also be a place of art. There will be concerts and other public offerings that will be uplifting and wholesome and spiritual. It will be a gift to the Master, whose birth we commemorate at that season of the year. As construction progressed, the presiding bishopric sought President Hinckley's wishes on the specifications. He wanted an exterior material to be of little cottonwood granite. Many years before, Brigham Young had described little cottonwood granite as the finest material the Rocky Mountains could provide. As obstacles were encountered with harvesting the granite, we approached the First Presidency to see if they would consent to an alternative material. We were politely but firmly told that a way would be provided if we were but prayerful and persistent. In short, we were and we did. Long live this legacy as a memorial to his vision. President Hinckley created a bridge to the community. Mr. Keith Ratty, CEO of Questar, said this week, a few years ago, the business community celebrated President Hinckley as a giant in our city. In truth, he was much more than that. He was a giant worldwide. Lane Beatty, president of the Salt Lake Chamber, said in part, his energy and service, love for life, and commitment to goodness transformed us and contributed to the betterment of this world. A giant, yes, a prophetic giant. What will we remember about this beloved prophet, and what be, will be his lasting legacy? There is much to remember and many accomplishments to list. But I will remember most dearly his nearly 50 years of devoted, faithful service as an apostle, prophet, seer, and revelator. He testified of Christ on all the populated continents, in small towns and in large cities, standing on boxes in Hyde Park and via large electronic networks. He offered hope to the poor and weary and counseled those who needed to reach out a little more to their neighbors. The opening hymn, as announced, was the product of two young men who served as companions in the mission field. They both later served as general authorities. The music is by Elder G. Homer Durham, and the text is by Gordon B. Hinckley. The text expresses the strong, vibrant testament of President Hinckley I know that my Redeemer lives, triumphant Savior, Son of God, victorious over pain and death, my leader, my King, and my Lord. He lives, my one sure rock of faith, 
the one bright hope of men on earth, the beacon to a better way, the light beyond the veil of death. Oh, give me thy sweet spirit still, the peace that comes alone from thee, the faith to walk the lonely road that leads to thine eternity. Brothers and sisters, may we all follow his often given counsel to do and be the best we can and stand a little taller. Family with quiet dignity, you have endured well the sacrifice of sharing your Father with all of us. Please accept our thanks. May God comfort, bless, and keep each of you until you meet Him again. In the holy name of our Savior and Redeemer, even Jesus Christ, amen. I am grateful for this invitation to speak and pray that the Spirit will convey my testimony and words to your hearts. As I ponder the life of our beloved prophet, President Gordon B. Hinckley, I am reminded of the following verse from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and, departing, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Today I hope that as we honor this legacy, his legacy, we ponder the footprints on the sands of time left by President Hinckley. Think about what comes to your mind when I speak of the President Gordon B. Hinckley era. In the short time we have together, I can mention only a few footprints of the many that have made an impression on me. Gordon B. Hinckley was the great communicator. He opened the doors to the world's media and defined the church to a worldwide audience. Commencing as the young return missionary more than 70 years ago, he pioneered the use of film strips, movies, colored pictures, pamphlets, and missionary literature to tell the story of our church. These same techniques continually being improved are still used today. The Hinckley era invokes the image of missionary work to all the world. In the almost 13 years of President Hinckley's presidency, over 400,000 missionaries have been called, representing over 40 percent of all missionaries ever called since the church was organized. Almost one-third of all members today were baptized since President Hinckley became our prophet. President Hinckley's challenge to increase our missionary efforts and our retention of new converts remains a charge we are still working to achieve. Perhaps the most recognizable and eternal of all of the footprints on the sands of President Gordon B. Hinckley is the construction of approximately 75 new temples since he became our president. Every ordinance performed in these temples becomes a witness to the prophetic foresight and wisdom of President Hinckley to bring temples closer to the people. How grateful we are as individuals and as a church for this remarkable legacy. Another wonderful and likable of President Hinckley's footprints on the sands is his warm sense of humor. Everyone who associated with him or heard him speak remembers an incident in which his unique sense of humor was evident. I remember an occasion several years ago after he began to use a cane. I arrived at the church administration building about seven o'clock in the morning. And as I approached the elevator, I saw President Hinckley and a security officer coming toward the elevator. I pushed the button, the elevator door opened, and I stepped inside, holding the door open. I could hear President Hinckley with his cane approaching. As he came to the open door, President Hinckley looked at me, kept walking, and said, Earl, go ahead and ride the elevator. I'm taking the stairs. The elevator door closed. I felt about that high. 
I comfortably rode up to my floor while the Prophet of the Lord climbed the stairs to his office. On another occasion, as the general authorities, dressed in their dark suits, white shirts, and conservative ties, entered a meeting with the First Presidency, President Hinckley, with a twinkle in his eye and a smile on his face, said, You all look like a bunch of penguins. <laughs> we will miss his sense of humor. President Hinckley was truly a Renaissance man. He had wide interest and was an expert in many areas. With the construction of the Conference Center, which itself is one of the great legacies of President Hinckley, we have witnessed the further development and expansion of musical and theatrical performances in the church. Our lives are better because these cultural opportunities are now available to us. One of the most expansive of all of the legacies of President Hinckley, and truly one of his footprints on the sands, is church education. The magnificence of Brigham Young University and the expanded BYU-Idaho, BYU-Hawaii, LDS Business College campuses and seminaries and institutes of religion are evidence of his love of education and of students. The establishment of the Perpetual Education Fund seven years ago enhances this legacy. Nearly 30,000 students throughout much of the world are now improving their lives through the remarkable opportunities of education. Lesser understood but of significant importance in church administration is President Hinckley's establishment of the Quorums of the Seventy as one of the presiding quorums in the Church. Increasing the number of quorums and the members of the Seventy fourfold accommodates the growth and administration of the Church and fulfills the scriptural mandate that the Twelve may now call upon the Seventy when they need assistance to fill the several calls for preaching and administering the gospel instead of any others. Perhaps the most personal and long-remembered footprint of President Hinckley may be his love of people. Probably each of us in this vast worldwide audience has a special memory of President Hinckley. I hope my remarks may represent a few of your thoughts, should you have had the opportunity to express them here today. For each primary child, youth, young adult, member, and friend, May I say, thank you, President Hinckley. Thank you for your valiant life of service to the Lord. Thank you for your example of integrity and steadfastness. Thank you for your wisdom and judgment. Thank you for your talks, writings, and inspired counsel. Thank you for your unwavering witness of the calling of the Prophet Joseph Smith. Thank you for your testimony and teachings concerning our Heavenly Father and our relationship as spirit sons and daughters to Him. Thank you for your testimony of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the footprints on the sands of time you have left behind. Thank you for letting us know that you loved us. We are better because of you. May I also say thank you to the Hinckley family for sharing your father and grandfather with us. Dear President Hinckley, we have watched you grow old on stage. May you now enjoy eternal companionship with your beloved Marjorie, other family members, and prior leaders of the Church. President Hinckley, we love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Jesus.
President Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles will now speak to us. He will be followed by President Henry B. Eyring, who served as second counselor to President Gordon B. Hinckley. President Packer. I first met Gordon B. Hinckley more than 50 years ago. I'd been called as an assistant to the Twelve in the same conference he was sustained as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. His first words at the pulpit were, I know what I have not cut, that I have not come along this road alone and feel very grateful for the many men and women, good men and women, those here today and those who have served. The wonderful people whose names I do not remember have helped me. Gordon B. Hinckley first arrived at church headquarters on his way home from his mission in England. He had been asked by his mission president to report to the First Presidency, President Heber J. Grant, David O. McKay, and J. Reuben Clark, Jr. The 15-minute minute meeting lasted over an hour. He was asked to serve as secretary to the New Church Mission Literature Committee. He was on his own to wrestle about and find an empty office somewhere. A friend whose father owned an office supply store gave him an old warp table. He put a block of wood under the short leg. He brought his own typewriter from home. He went to the supply room and asked for a ream of paper and was asked, do you have any idea how many sheets of paper in a ream? He replied, yes, 500 sheets. What in the world do you suppose you're going to do with 500 sheets of paper? He answered, I'm going to write on them, one sheet at a time. <laughs> he, he never stopped writing. For years I've had a weekly meeting with President Hinckley. Often I found him at his desk writing out his talks in longhand. My first assignment as an assistant of the Twelve was an assistant to Elder Hinckley in the missionary department. Soon thereafter, he left to tour the missions in Europe with President Henry D. Moyle. After he returned, he told me that one of the hardest things he had ever had to do happened in Dusseldorf. On their last evening in Europe, President Moyle hosted a dinner for the missionaries, including Elder Hinckley's son, Richard. Elder Hinckley said goodbye to his son at the hotel. He said to watch Richard walk away with his companion into the cold, dark night was the hardest thing he'd ever had to do. He wept as he told me about it. Brother Hinckley's extraordinary intelligence and his incredible memory were immediately apparent, but I had learned something else more important. I had seen inside of Elder Gordon B. Hinckley. He's always been a very private person, and only occasionally does one see inside of him. In trying to describe President Hinckley's ability to communicate, I recalled a few years ago traveling in Pakistan with Elder Jacob de Auger, one of the 70, who was referred to as our happy, smiling Dutchman. Our host was Mr. Suleiman Habib, a longtime friend and prominent banking, from prominent banking family in Karachi. One day Suleiman took us out to the, of the city, to the countryside, to see one of his farms. We came upon a large group of laborers, poorly dressed, building a road with pick and shovel. They spoke in the Urdu language neither Jacob nor I had ever heard before. The cart hardly stopped when Jacob was out of the door. He mingled with the laborers. Suleiman watched him intently, then turned to me and said, that man can communicate with the Urdu people better than I can. A moment later he added, that man could charm a donkey or a king. Whatever power of communication and charm Suleiman saw in Jacob de Auger, was found in a rich major in Gordon B. Hinckley. There came to my office one day an Islamic cleric 
who was in Salt Lake City to receive treatment at the Moran Eye Center. I arranged for an audience with the First Presidency. Dr. Abdurrahman Wahid, much like President Hinckley, had a sparkling sense of humor. Accompanying Dr. Wahid was Dr. Alwa Shihab, a professor of Islamic studies at Harvard University. In that meeting, Dr. Wahid mentioned that he had been asked to run for the office of president of Indonesia. If I'm elected, Dr. Wahid said, Alwa Shihab will be my foreign minister. President Hinckley said, if you decide to run and you're elected, I'll come to visit you in Jakarta. He was elected, and we did go to Jakarta, where Brother Hinckley was guest of honor at a dinner given at the presidential palace. The first message of condolence I received on the death of President Hinckley was from Alwi Shihab. And yesterday there arrived a very large floral tribute from President Wahid, former president of Indonesia. I have regarded the, this power of communication and charm of President Hinckley as simply brotherly love and humility. It was always apparent whether he was with the laborers on a dusty road or a banquet in a presidential palace. It was there. President Hinckley grew up schooled in the doctrines of the gospel. His roots go back to Coe Fort in central Utah. Restored, it stands now much as it did when pioneer days when his grandfather built it. Much of President Hinckley's growth I attribute to his wife, Marjorie Pay Hinckley, who was patient with a man who was always on the go, always ten steps ahead of her. For example, one evening he was packing for an overseas trip the following morning. Marjorie asked, well, am I going with you? He responded, we don't have to decide that right now. <laughs> he knew, as we all should know, that the doctrines of Jesus Christ are synonymous with family. Succession to the presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a remarkable process. Always the senior apostle becomes president, and the next senior apostle becomes the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Outlined in the Revelations are truths and instruction by which the brethren administer the Church. Whatever the crisis or whatever the opportunity, the directions and guidance can be found in the verses of the Scripture. No one who has known the order of things speculates on who will be the next president of the church. It has always been the pattern. There is no aspiring for position, no avoiding the Lord's will. Gordon B. Hinckley did not seek the many calls and assignments that came to him, but he did not shy away either. One of the earliest revelations, the Lord said, that every man might speak in the name of God the Lord, even the Savior of the world, that the weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones. With the Church growing very rapidly worldwide, we often go to distant places to organize or reorganize a unit of the Church, sometimes when the Church is very new. We are asked, where on earth will you find the new leaders? We don't have to find them. They're already there, just as Gordon B. Hinckley was there. The Lord provides them. They're serving faithfully and paying for the privilege and tithes and offerings. In a separate ordinance following baptism, members of the Church have conferred upon them the Holy Ghost, which the scriptures explain will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. The Holy Ghost is the inspirer. The inspiration is always there. And if you learn to live with it and can work with it and for it. One of the things President Hinckley understood best is the word family. It's not difficult to find statements on the family in his sermons and talks and counsel. 
whether large congregations or individuals or more practically with families. I pay tribute to the family of Gordon Bittner and Marjorie Pay Hinckley. They can be described as ideal. They, like their father, are unassuming. Whatever prominence that has come to them does not show any more than it was visible in him. In the cemetery, not far from here, there is a headstone with Marjorie Pay Hinckley engraved on it and beside her now engraved the name of Gordon Bittner Hinckley. When Mary approached the tomb of Jesus, an angel said, He is not here, he is risen. In due course, it can be said to Gordon Bittner Hinckley and Marjorie Pay Hinckley, they are not here, they are risen together. May our Father bless the memory of this gentle prophet and his eternal companion, and the sacred work over which he presided, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We each feel that something has been taken from our hearts with the death of President Hinckley. There was a sense of happy anticipation to look forward to his powerful witness of the Savior, to feel his love for us and to know that he would bring us a smile and hope as he spoke of even the most difficult challenges. In the last few days, I have remembered his voice. I have heard that voice so many times when a difficult problem facing the Church was brought to him. He would listen carefully, perhaps asking a question or two to be sure that he understood the magnitude of the difficulty facing us and that those who brought the problem to him knew he understood. Time after time, he would quietly say something like this with a pleasant smile, Oh, things will work out. He was an optimist. Some of that came from his great personal capacities. Many problems he could work out himself. He saw the way to build temples across the earth. He gave the credit to the faithful saints who paid their tithes in good times and in hard times. But he was the one who sketched as he returned from Colonia Juarez, Mexico to El Paso, Texas, the design for those smaller temples which now bless people across the world. He was the one who saw a way for young people in many countries to walk out of poverty by choosing for themselves a training program which would give them the capacity to repay a small loan from what he named the Perpetual Education Fund. He is the one who conceived of this lovely conference center where thousands unite their faith to hear the Word of God. His personal legacy goes beyond that brief list and my power to describe. But his accomplishments have at least one thing in common. Always they were to bless individuals with opportunity. And always he thought of those with the least opportunity, the ordinary person struggling to cope with the difficulties of everyday life and the challenge of living the gospel of Jesus Christ. More than once, he tapped his finger on my chest somewhere where my heart is when I made a suggestion and said, Hal, have you remembered the person who is struggling? He is in the spirit world today among the noble prophets who have lived on the earth. He is surely aware of our sorrow and our sense of loss at our separation from him. He knew at the end of his life the pain in his heart of losing someone he loved. If we told him of our grief, he would listen carefully. And then I think he would say something like this with sympathy in, it, sympathy in his voice but with a sound in it that would bring a smile to our lips. Oh, it will work out. It has for him. His optimism was justified not by confidence in his own powers to work things out, but by his great faith that God's powers were in place. He knew that a loving Heavenly Father had prepared a way for families to be bound together forever. He wanted so much to be in the temple in Rexburg, Idaho, 
Tomorrow was to be the day of dedication. He thrilled at the dedication of temples. He knew what they could mean for someone who yearned to be reunited forever with a loved one from whom they had been separated by death. Things did work out. He is with Marjorie again, the girl of his dreams. They will be companions forever in glory and in a family. His optimism stemmed from his unwavering faith in Jesus Christ and the power of his atonement. He was certain that we would all be resurrected because the Savior was. He was sure that we could all be sealed in families forever, to live in the presence of God the Father and His beloved Son, if only we would make a choice to be true to sacred covenants with God. He spoke of such a day of choice in his own life. As a discouraged young missionary in England, his father sent him a letter which said, in essence, forget yourself and go to work. In his room at 15 Waltham Road, he had been reading earlier that day these words of the Savior, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. I heard him say that he then went upstairs, knelt down in prayer, and promised the Lord that he would do his best. President Hinckley said of that promise, I have been doing that ever since. Now, President Hinckley's best may be so much more than we can offer the Master, but all God asks of us is that we give our best. President Hinckley would understand our feelings of weakness. He once looked at the pictures of the prophets who preceded him in this dispensation. He said quietly, when I look at those pictures and think of where I am, I feel so inadequate. President Hinckley rarely showed emotion, but in that moment he began to weep. I think not out of fear, but out of gratitude. He had consecrated all he had and was to the Savior's service. Because of his trust in the Savior, he knew that would be enough. Faith in his heart left no room for doubt or fear. That unfailing confidence in the power of God shaped what he was able to see in the progress of the Lord's Church. No one was more aware of problems than he. And yet time and again he would say of the Church that we have never done better. And he would give you the facts to prove it. Then he would say with conviction in his voice, and the best is yet to come. His optimism came from his youthful choice to consecrate all he had to the Savior and his work out of faith. He chose to put the gospel down into his heart by giving his best all his life. That brought to him a blessing he would want us to claim. He more than hoped that things would work out. He knew they would if only he would go forward in faith. I saw what that allowed God to do for him and his heart as his life closed. Just a few days ago, as President Monson and I greeted him, he smiled and extended his hand to each of us. He asked me, Hal, how are you? I gave a simple answer, fine. I only wish I had answered better than ever. And I know the best is yet to come because I was blessed to live when I could hear your voice and learn from your example. His example even changed what I read. I knew that he loved reading Shakespeare from his college days as a student of Benjamin Roland Lewis. So I got a copy of the collected works of Shakespeare. I mentioned to President Hinckley that I was reading it. He said, how do you find the time? <laughs> and then he asked, where are you reading in it? I said, Henry V. His reply was, that's a good place to start, with the emphasis on the word start, to make it clear that there was much work ahead. His example of courage in my reading in that play helped me understand a lesson he had tried to teach me years before about serving Heavenly Father's children. When I was responsible for teaching the gospel 
to our youth and our seminary programs across the world, he had said, again tapping his forefinger on my chest, Hal, why don't you do better in getting the gospel down into their hearts? He knew that only when it was down in their hearts, as it wasn't his, would they be strong enough and brave enough to qualify for eternal life. He loved young people. He knew their weaknesses and the fierce opposition which they would face. And he must have known the words which Shakespeare gave King Henry to speak who was about to lead his small force into battle against overwhelming odds. O God of battles, steal my soldiers' hearts. Possess them not with fear. Take from them the sense of reckoning. If opposed numbers, pluck their hearts from them. President Hinckley knew that God will steal and fortify us all as we choose to take the gospel down into our, into our hearts. And he knew that choice was made by consecrating all we are and have to follow the Master. He knew it was best to make that choice early in the days of youth because it might take years for us to qualify for the change in our hearts which come because of the Atonement of Jesus Christ. For all of us across the world, I express gratitude for such a prophet, such a teacher, such a father, and such a friend. He was a true witness of Jesus Christ and a prophet of God. We are better because of his influence and his example. And the best can be yet to come as we take the gospel of Jesus Christ down into our hearts as he did. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. It will now be my opportunity to address you. And following my remarks, these services will conclude with the choir singing, My Shepherd Will Supply My Need. The benediction will then be offered by President Hinckley's daughter, Sister Kathleen H. Walker. And after the benediction, we request that the congregation remain in place until the Hinckley family and those who have been invited to travel to the official a funeral cortege have left the conference center. My beloved brothers and sisters and members of the Hinckley family, I am deeply honored by this privilege to pay tribute to my cherished friend and colleague, President Gordon B. Hinckley. The poet wrote, Here and there and now and then, God makes a giant among men. President Hinckley was such a giant, a giant of knowledge, of faith, of love, of testimony, of compassion, of vision. I cannot adequately express how much I miss him. It's difficult to recall a time when he and I did not know each other. We were friends long before either one of us was called to be a general authority of the Church, and we have served side by side for over 44 years in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and in the First Presidency. We have shared much over the years, heartache and happiness, sorrow and laughter. Since his passing on Sunday, I have reflected on some of the countless experiences we have had together. I share with you just a few. In May of 1964, he and I were assigned together to the Gunnison, Utah stake. Prior to our first meeting on Saturday, I noticed that the cuffs of President Hinckley's shirt were held together with paper clips <laughs> instead of cufflinks. I said to him, Gordon, I like your cufflinks. He laughed and said that he had forgotten to bring his cufflinks. I replied that as a good Boy Scout, I had come prepared and had another set, which I was more than happy to give to him, and I did. On another occasion back in the mid-60s, Sister Monson and I, along with Elder Spencer W. Kimball and Sister Kimball, were invited by the Hinckleys to have dinner at their home. During the course of the evening, the doorbell rang. 
when it was opened. There stood one of the Hinckley's home teachers without his companion. He was invited in and he seated himself on the sofa in the Hinckley living room. We all sat down and were rather fascinated as the home teacher began what could only be described as grilling the Hinckley's as to how they were doing in such areas as family prayer, family scripture study, family home evening, personal scripture study, and on and on. As they would answer one question, the home teacher would fire another one at them. Of course, all was done in a good-natured way, and it was obvious to us that this home teacher took his duty seriously. During the past few years, we've all enjoyed observing President Hinckley with his cane, walking to a seat in the conference center while waving to the crowd, or using it to tap someone on the shoulder. <laughs> President Hinckley and I have for years gone to the same doctor. And during one of my visits a couple of years ago, the doctor said to me, could you please do me a favor? President Hinckley should use his cane for walking <laughs> because it steadies him. The last thing we want is for him to fall and break a hip or worse. Instead, he, he waves it around <laughs> and then doesn't use it when he walks. <laughs> Tell him the cane has been prescribed by his doctor and he needs to use it as it was meant to be used. <laughs> I listened to the physician's request and then replied, Doctor, I am President Hinckley's counselor. You are his doctor. <laughs> you tell him. <laughs> May I share just one final experience, a simple act which has touched me deeply. Each Thursday morning, the members of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles have a meeting in the temple. We're driven in carts underground from the church office parking lot to the temple. During the cold winter months, President Hinckley always wore a coat and a hat during the brief ride. As our cart passed under Main Street, President Hinckley knew that we were then within the confines of the temple rather than under the street. And without a word, we remove his hat and place it on his lap. He seemed to know instinctively when that moment arrived. It was such a simple yet profound expression of reverence and respect for the house of the Lord. And it made a deep impression on me. Most of you will remember learning of Sir Thomas More, an English statesman and author of an earlier period who was steadfast in cleaving unto his beliefs. He was called a man for all seasons. Amidst the conflicts of our time and the turbulence of our seasons, our Heavenly Father provided for us a man for all seasons. His name? President Gordon B. Hinckley. He was our prophet, seer, and revelator. He was an island of calm in a sea of storm. He was as a lighthouse to the lost mariner. He was your friend and my friend. He comforted and calmed us when conditions in the world were frightening. He guided us undeviatingly on the path which will lead us back to our Heavenly Father. Since all who wanted to greet President Hinckley personally could not go to him, he went worldwide to them as long as he was able to travel. He was a prophet to the people, not neglected were the children who flocked to his side, nor did he overlook the parents of those precious ones. President Hinckley has truly been a prophet for our time. It was said of the Master that he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man and went about doing good 
for God was with him. President Hinckley has devoted his life to doing good, and God has surely been with him. Just a week and a half ago, President Hinckley met with President Eyring and with me in our first presidency meeting. His voice was strong. His mind was clear. He was self-assured and decisive. A few days later, he lay near death. His family members gathered to be near him in his last hours. President Eyring and I were privileged to be with him and the family on Saturday and again on Sunday when we were joined by President Boyd K. Packer. As long as I live, I shall cherish the memory of my last visit to his home, brief hours before his passing. We provided a blessing, joined by all of his family members and others present who held the priesthood. It was a sacred time of parting. We knew the veil was very thin and that he was being summoned to the other side. As I returned to my home, I recalled the sweet and poignant statement President Heakley had made in his talk at the General Relief Society broadcast in September of 2003, when his sweet Marjorie was still by his side. Speaking of her, he said, For 66 years, we've walked together hand in hand with love and encouragement and with appreciation and respect. It cannot be very long before one of us will sleep and step through the veil. I hope the other will follow soon. I just would not know how to get along without her, even on the other side. And I would hope that she would not know how to get along without me." Close quote. Within six months, his beloved Marjorie has stepped through the veil. He missed her every day, every moment. What a glorious reunion they've now had. To you children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, remember that President Hinckley still lives. He's on a heavenly mission. To others who await his influence and testimony, his plea to all of you could be found in the book of 3 John. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. My dear brothers and sisters, all that we knew and loved about President Gordon B. Hinckley continues. His spirit has simply gone home to that God who gave him life. Wherever I go, in this beautiful world, a part of this cherished friend will always go with me. On more than one occasion, President Hinckley used as his message the words to one of his favorite hymns. You all know it. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsel's guide uphold you. With his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. When life's perils thick confound you, put his arms unfailing round you. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. Keep love's banner floating o'er you. Smite death's threatening way before you. God be with you till we meet again till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. God be with you till we meet again. I share with you the words he spoke in a general conference. After quoting that hymn, such becomes his farewell to all of us, said he, God be with you. Till we meet again, my beloved associates. I've sung those simple words in a thousand places across the world with love and affection. I've sung them in English 
when others sang them in a score of languages. I've lifted my voice with those wonderful and simple words on memorable occasions on all the continents of the earth. I've sung them in bidding farewell to missionaries with tears in my eyes. I've sung them with men in battle dress during times of war, in a thousand places and in many circumstances over these almost numberless years, I have raised my voice with so many others in these parting words. God bless you, my dear friends. Close quote. On behalf of each one of us, my brothers and sisters, I offer our final farewell to our beloved prophet, President Gordon B. Hinckley. Gordon, God be with you till we meet again in the sacred name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen.
Our Father in heaven, with deep gratitude, we offer a benediction on thy service, on this service. So grateful are we for this man who has worn out his life in thy service. We are grateful to have been a part of it. We know that our lives have been lifted by his teachings, by his example. May the memory of the things we have learned remain with us forever. May they buoy us and carry us as we continue to move forward and try in every way to bring honor to his life and to his name. We have loved him as a father, as a grandfather, as a great-grandfather. We have loved him as a prophet. We have loved him as a man who has walked the earth proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our hearts are tender today as we say goodbye. But we are buoyed with the knowledge that he lives and that we too may return to him again and be with him as family and friends and walk the halls of eternity together. And now as we say goodbye, we recognize that he is in thy hands until we meet again in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.